Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining so early. Um, let's see if we will double in number during the course of this talk, but let's see where we can take this. Um, so I wanted to talk a bit about um, auditing and generally how to figure out security events. Um, because oftentimes, security often looks like this. Um, or at least oftentimes you have the feeling it is like that, that the vendor or whoever you're talking to is sitting in the middle and while the data is being exposed, they're still sitting there and saying everything is fine. And we kind of want to avoid that. Um, or generally, I would say the stages, how bad something could be, would be something like this. Um, worst case would probably, you learn something bad happened from your users or from the press. Um, you're not going to have a good day when that happens. Um, Next step is maybe that somebody takes your data ransom. That happens, unfortunately, uh, quite frequently, that somebody takes your data and then asks for a ransom to get your data back or maybe not get your data back. Um, or you just see it on your cloud provider's bill because somebody got a hold of some of your credentials or access credentials, for example, your AWS keys, and started mining bitcoins. Then it's just getting very expensive. Um, maybe a bit embarrassing, but mainly expensive, so that's OK. Um, Ideally, you learn about it yourself after the fact. And even better, you learn it yourself that something has happened, and you can even prove what actually has happened. And the idea is like, how can I prove what actually happened to my system? Uh, what, what is going on? And basically, you want to avoid the bottom half where you figure out everything is on fire and everything is terrible. And we don't want to go there. That's the general idea. So where do we start? Um, obviously, there are no silver bullets, and everybody promising you a silver bullet um, is probably wrong uh, in one way or another. Um, so, well, there are no silver bullets, but I want to start with Audit D. Is anybody using Audit D? Okay, maybe. Um, so, it's uh, that's the description from the main page. Um, Audit D is the user space component from the auditing subsystem. Um, and it's just generating the, uh, the, the events, basically, um, that it has captured. And it looks something like this. Um, or let's start with the features. Generally, you can access file and network accesses. You can see any system calls, or depending on how you configure it, you can catch those. You can see which commands have been run by a user. And you can generally just get security events. And it looks something like this. You have your application, and your application is doing some calls to the kernel. And then based on three filters, um, where you filter them based by user, by task, or when they exit on the exit code, um, you can always check, like, does it pass through my exclude list? And if it does, then you can record the event in the auditing daemon. So basically, if it passes your exclude rules, then you're recording the event, and you're collecting what somebody is doing. Um, so to just quickly show how this might look like, so um, let's start with our report. Um, this has been running very shortly here. Um, just to give you an idea, I set this up yesterday evening, so it was only running for like one and a half minutes. Um, but you can also really see like um, configuration changes, number of login attempts, uh, how many groups and users and roles are there. So you just get an overview of what has been going on on your system. That's the our report. Um, you can also use the, the brother, the all search. And for example, to get just the raw event, you just type in raw, and then you could see this, for example, is one possible event. So every event um, has a type. Um, here you can see, OK, a daemon ended. That was when I actually stopped audit D. Um, you can see there is a message, there is the audit uh, event, and the first thing here, this is a, ti a timestamp, and afterwards, that is an ID. So after the colon, that is the ID of the event. You could have the same timestamp and the same ID for events if you capture multiple things from one processes, for example. Um, and then you have other key value pairs of what actually happened. So for example, um, you see the result was a success, um, the process ID was one, um, the auditing ID was zero, and you extract those. And to look at the event before, here um, the user started something with you know, it was a different timestamp and a different ID, so this is a totally different event. Uh, and you can see basically, you know, sudo opened a session uh, on one specific host name and it was a success. You could also do uh, add um, 
uh, additional filters. So you could say, I want success, uh, no. Um, we don't have any failed events in our audit log. Um, if you would, for example, say, I only want the successful events that ended in a successful yes. Um, sorry? Ah, I, yeah, that is true, and that's why it's not working. Um, so this one works if I type no. Um, then you don't have any matches with yes. Um, then you see just the successful events, just like the one we just had. Um, one thing that you can already see is that these messages are already quite varied. So this one is relatively simple. This one is much more complex, um, where you have um, this specific timestamp in there then as well. Um, so parsing that can be a pain. And if you want to figure out like what the success uh, or what are the specific types that are available and what is going on, um, you can find all of those in the documentation. Um, so for example, if you go to the Reddit documentation in that example, um, you will find various examples and they just walk you through things that can happen and types that happen and, and explain those. Um, sometimes you also want to set up more specific rules that you want to have yourself. Um, in the GitHub repository of Audit B, you have um, a bunch of rules that might make sense for you or might not make sense, for example. Um, we'll come back to that one, uh, but for example, for a power abuse, this is basically, let me make it slightly larger. What is happening here basically is um, a privileged user is looking into the home directory of an unprivileged user. So the user ID is greater than 1,000 for the unprivileged user. Basically, we're checking somebody is using or abusing their pseudo privileges to look into somebody else's home directory. Um, we'll actually try that out afterwards as well. Um, but here in that repository, you have a couple of examples of things that you might want to try out. Or if you try to generate any rules, this is kind of a good starting point to see which are the rules that are available and people can actually use. Um, OK. So we saw the logs. We saw more rules. Um, something that is still a bit work in progress, but there has been some progress, but it's like a large issue, is, for example, Docker support. Uh, or having namespace support, figuring out like some event happened just in this specific namespace or under this specific user then in that namespace. Um, it's a fairly complex issue and links to various other sub-issues uh, and that is still work in progress. So the idea is you don't just have one system but you have many systems and you basically want to collect all of them and want to see what is going on over all my systems. Um, so the problem then leads to how do you centralize this? Um, and now, it's kind of like where I'm from. I work for Elastic, the company behind Elasticsearch, Logsearch, Kibana, Beats, um, and we try to tackle this. Um, so I generally build Hello World programs, and this is like a Hello World of Audit D um, to see where we can get with this one. Um, so anybody not familiar with our stack, or most? most kind of familiar. Um, you know, we started off with the famous Elk stack, Elasticsearch, Logsearch, Kibana, uh, and then we tried to evolve that a bit further. Um, we added the so-called beats, which are like lightweight agents or forwarders. Um, then we tried to add that B to Elk, and then we came up with Belk or Elk B, um, which might look something like this. Um, you can see it's a B and it has the Elk horn, so it has everything. Um, but we're always a bit about scaling, and this is not very scalable. Because what happens if we have another open source product? Then we get another letter, and whatever that letter will be, it will be very hard to make up another animal. Um, and also, we need to do, redo the entire branding. So um, we kind of got rid of the Belk or Elk B. We, we do have sometimes stickers with it, uh, but now we just call it the Elastic Stack because that's super scalable. Whatever component we have, um, we just stick it in there. Maybe we have to redraw the colors and add one component somewhere here, but otherwise, the name stays the same, so that's a bit easier for us. And generally what this looks like is, and we'll only use um, these three components here. So you have Beats, which is like the lightweight agent or shipper. It's written in Go, so you have native binaries, and it's as small as possible just to forward events. For example, for log files, we have something called FileBeat, which I always describe it's a bit like tail F over the network. So it's just forwarding log events. Uh, then we have Logstash to parse the data, for example, and enrich it. What could be enrichment? Any guesses? 
For, yes, for example, if you have an IP address and you want to get the geo point for the IP address, that could be the enrichment state. And we generally do that when we ingest the event. So we actually enrich it when we store it. So the search and retrieval afterwards is much faster. Um, also, for example, with IP addresses, IP ranges can change over time. Um, so it might be a good idea to actually take the kind of owner at the point of time when you ingest the event, because six months later, somebody else might own the IP address and it might have just moved around. Um, so that's what Logstash is doing. Then Elasticsearch is just storing everything. And then we have Kibana to visualize it. Um, today, I will just focus on Beats, Elasticsearch, and Kibana and use those how to collect things. So, um, and all of that is Apache 2 license, so you can just take it and go wild with it. Um, so, the first thing we did is um, I showed you the all search raw, like the raw event logs, and they're also in a file on the file system. So, the natural thing is we pointed file beat to the file and said, like, okay, collect this file, and then we tried to parse it. Um, by the way, we added something called file beat modules now because we figured out there are some things that are very frequent that people need to do very frequently. For example, collect Nginx logs or MySQL logs or something like that. And we have so-called modules for those. So basically, we tell FileBeat, hey, collect Nginx or in our ca case, audit D, and it will know automatically on your operating system, Ubuntu. It's in var log, whatever you're trying to get. It will know, OK, this file is, or this log file is in this location. And the default format for your operating system is this. It will then also know how to parse that automatically. And you don't need to set up those rules for every single, or not everybody needs to set up the same rules for Nginx, for example. Um, because, well, previously with Logstash, you would always add your custom rules to say, like, this is Nginx, and this is MySQL, and that is an Apache HDPD. Um, it was kind of boring that everybody had to do the same thing. So we kind of got cleverer, and we, we do stuff like that automatically. Now, now, what do we even have here? So uh, just to give you an idea, um, sudo vi etc, filebeat, filebeat yaml. This is where the filebeat configuration lives. And to collect the audit D event, what I'm doing here is basically I say I have the filebeat module, I point it to audit D, um, I add some tags, for example, here, this is the name of my instance. I just give it some tags because we can. Uh, I enrich it with cloud metadata and host metadata, and then I just put it or throw it to my Elasticsearch instance with the username and everything. Um, and this is all you need to do to collect that auditing event. Um, what that looks like is if I had over to, we have, Dashboards for those modules. We generally have dashboards to visualize what has happened here. Um, so if I search for audit D and you see the file beat module, I hope that is large enough for everybody to see. Um, since I only had audit D running for a short amount of time at night tonight, uh, let's change the time frame to the last 24 hours. Um, uh, and you can see um, these were the, the events that we have in that auditing log. So this is a bit like the all report where you saw this was the overview of things that happened. Uh, but here you could also do, for example, uh, you could just filter into one of them and say, like, I'm only interested in those events. So if you click on that little plus in the magnifying glass, it adds a filter here. And then you can see all of those cred this uh, events were done by root. Um, and then you could throw those away again. And then if you scroll down, for example, you can see here um, we didn't have any failures over time. But here, when I started audit D, we had some events in a short amount of time. You could also see, for example, where have these been happening? And well, this was me when I just set it up. So it does a reverse GUIP lookup on the data. And you can see the raw events down here. So this is basically just parsing that out. Um, however, at some point, we figured out that parsing that file was a major pain in the ass because every line looks different. And you know, you write regular expressions to parse it. and does anybody like writing regular expressions? Like every, every time somebody says, like, yes, I, I like to write regular expression, I would say it's the Stockholm Syndrome, where you just got so used to it um, that you start liking it. But I personally don't like it. And uh, writing regular expressions can be such a pain. And then um, we also had like that dog fooding um, problem. Or, or maybe you don't want to say dog food, but we might prefer like drink your own champagne 
because it sounds much fancier. Um, but we have our own cloud service. And they had that need and they said, well, we have all this technology. We want to s be sure, like, did somebody break into our instances or what have people been doing? And we want to monitor that. But we don't want to rely on parsing those files because, well, it's a pain. Um, so what do we do? So we created something called Audit Beat. Basically, it's using the Audit D syntax. Um, and so you just use the same configurations. Uh, but it's running that automatically for you, and you don't need to parse it anymore. Um, so what that does is it can do correlation of events. Um, it automatically resolves the user IDs to the usernames, uh, and it can s forward the data directly to Elasticsearch. You don't basically have it in a structured format, then write it out to a file, and then parse it back. But since the, the binary has it in a structured format already, it can just forward <laughs> it in a structured way directly to Elasticsearch. Um, Sometimes people ask why, why not eBPF, um, which is probably more powerful. The downside of eBPF is it depends a bit on newer kernel versions, and we have a lot of customers on very old kernels as well. And with, uh, the, what is it, the extended Berkeley packet filter. Um, it's another way to filter for security events, but it needs relatively new kernel versions uh, to do that. It's just another way to get similar kinds of events. It's <laughs> uh, not just networking, it, it in, or it ties into the network as well, uh, but you can get all kinds of uh, events uh, out of eBPF. Um, but it needs new, uh, it, depending on the feature set, um, because features were added over time, uh, with very old kernels, you have a very limited subset of features. Newer kernels have more features. Um, but we didn't want to rely on having a newer kernel, but we wanted to have something that's kind of working on all the ways as well. And Audit D has been around for a long time, so that's generally available. Um, and we think it might be slightly easier to configure. And also, it has Docker metadata enrichment built in. So basically, we just look up against the Docker daemon uh, in which namespace is this running, and it will properly tie into Docker or any, any container namespacing that you have. So what do we have here? Um, we have another binary now, um, which is called audit D, so it looks like this. Uh, audit B. If you could just type. Oops. Um, so basically, we have an audit D module here. We have some configurations. These configurations you have. Um, Mostly uh, in, in Audit D as well, for example, the backlog limit, how many events should you look in the past, that is something you can configure or by default configure in Audit D as well. Uh, we have added some other things, for example, yes, we want to resolve IDs automatically, we don't want to rate limit it. You might want to do it if you have a lot of events, uh, not to overload um, your system collecting and forwarding all of those events. And if I want to collect the raw events, but well, I didn't because it might be just too many events. And then, uh, thanks to the awesomeness of YAML, uh, you can just pass in after the pipe like your good old audit D configuration rules. So you're reusing the same rules. And because I always forget, I wrote a comment for myself, and you can see. Um, generally, watching a file starts with dash w, um, or to have a syscall, you have an action, and then the filter you want to use. Um, and the filter action can either be always or never. Um, and then the filter can specify which specific kernel rules you want to target. Um, and those can be a task, exit, or a user. And you can also exclude something. Uh, and then you can add additional keywords, which we'll use after the words with dash k to identify our events and what happened. And you can group several rules into one by this dash s, or capital S. And it looks something like this. Here, for example, um, any file access to etc, group, pass, wd, g, shadow, etc., um, is locked and gets a key of identity. So I could afterwards um, filter down to the key identity to see who has tried to access those files. And obviously, you could, whatever files are sensitive for you, you could just add those. And as soon as somebody accesses those, uh, you want to trigger or create an event. Um, here, for example, um, I say if one of my I pick the user ID of one specific user. We'll use that user afterwards. Um, if that user logs in, um, I want to be notified if they try to access etc pass wd. Um, and then we add a tag developer pass wd read. Um, so, yes? So, you added this flexibility just because of the general pattern of having this flexibility to that level? Or yeah. Or there was a specific need of filtering these things at this level because you can filter a lot on the system through the audit itself. Yeah. The audit filtering rule. And you probably want 
Yes. Oh no no no! This is this is not from so that example. This is a bigger question. Ah yeah. I, I, so the question was like, why this specific rule basically? Um, well, this, this specific cell, set of rules, right? This, this flexibility. Ah. Why it was so, bad. so why this set of rules? Um, so no, this is not what our cloud team is using, and I I'm probably I should not even share what the cloud team is using because they're trying to find the bad guys, and if I show like what are they searching on? it would give kind of a stupid advantage to the attackers, so I'm not sharing like the actual rules. These are just like the hello world rules that you could do with audit D. So this is just, since this is the, the general audit D syntax, I just picked some... Uh, this is audit D syntax. This yeah, this is the, yeah, yeah, we're reusing the audit D syntax one to one. So you could use this exactly uh, in audit D, and we just reuse the same syntax. Um, so the syntax is maybe weird, like, I, I'm not super used to it, or I'm like, okay, maybe this makes sense, but this is what Audit D is using. And to make that switch easier, and we didn't want to create another proprietary system uh, where we say we have our own configuration language and now learn our configuration language, we're just reusing what Audit D is providing. And we're tying into that. And these are just some sample rules just to show you some stuff that is going on. Um, yeah, so this is what we're collecting with those, basically. Um, and it might look something like this. So if I had over um, to audit D um, and I had over to the overview, here you can see this has been running for the last 24 hours and you can see, for example, we have a lot of our events are user logins or system services. And you just have um, a breakdown into user logins, authenticated and logged in users, or those events are all some auditing rules that we had, and here most of them were that some program was executed, but we have some more here. And you can just see over time how many events happened. Um, and down here you can basically see which user did what action, and you could even unfold one of them uh, and see the raw event, and whatever that raw event here was. So you can see here something with SSHD was uh, being run. Um, Two nice things, by the way, that we are doing here is, first off, we are enriching that with the host information, so you can see on which operating system was that running. So you can see I'm using the latest Ubuntu. Um, sorry for that. It's an old habit, it dies hard. Um, and the second thing, um, we are enriching the cloud metadata. So since this is running on AWS, you can see this is running in Ireland in the 1A availability zone with that instance ID on that instance type, etc. So you could filter down, for example, I'm only interested in one availability zone or I know maybe one of my instances has been compromised and I only want to see events for that specific instance. Or with the operating system, you might know, oh, there was a security issue with just one specific operating system in one specific version. And then you could just filter down on those and see like, did anything specific happen on those instances um, to see what is going on there? Yes? Um, parsing the events, you said that parsing the events is hard. So did you implement the parsing of the events through the uh, how parse library inside your... Uh, so the question was, uh, did we implement parsing that? No. So what I showed you at first, the, the file beat module, that used the parsing rules. So that basically took the, what our search raw would give you or in a log file that we parsed. Here, since we run the binary, in the binary we have it as a structured format. So we don't write it out to a file just to parse it back, but we wrap the audit D binary, run that, have there the, the information in a structured way, and then we can send it off to Elasticsearch directly. So we're not going this indirection through a file basically. So, so there is, there is a confusion even in the binary form, you need to massage data. You need to process it. You need to combine different events. You need to sort of, the binary is not enough. You need, you need to process it. Yes, I mean, we, we do process it. So the question was, do we process it? Yes, we do process it. For example, um, this enrichment here, um, that happens in the binary already. This is not like after the fact. Like basically, um, for the host metadata, we just use whatever, uh, whatever call, maybe LSB, uh, whatever to get the operating system um, out. 
So that is enriched when you collect it and not really after the fact. Ah, no, I have not seen it. It's called O shape. O shape. Yeah. Okay. A U shape. A -U -shape. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that, that sounds very similar since we, in the end, we also generate JSON because Elasticsearch uses JSON, so it's just basically generating JSON right. and so forwards the to JSON directly. The point of the A U shape was to ship it to Elasticsearch. So ah, interesting. Then we have kind of the, the same goal in two different ways. Yeah, so it would be nice. Yeah, interesting. Okay, I'll, I'll look into that. Wait, I, I've never seen all shape before, to be honest. Um, cool. Um, okay, so we have that. Um, we have, by the way, um, we have both this auditing event, but we also have some other information. And this is just from the plain log files. And then you can collect or connect that, for example. Um, you could see, for example, which users um, have I created in my system. Um, for example, here you can see this is when I created my different users in my system. Or you could, for example, also see like when were sudo commands being run. Uh, and you can see um, all search success yes has been run by the Ubuntu user four times. And you can collect that kind of information uh, and just see how those work. Okay, so let's try something else. So I want to SSH into my box. Uh, let's say we use the Elastic user. And well, let's enter a wrong password for a change. Where will I get this event from? Where will failed login attempts by SSH? Secure, yeah, I think in Ubuntu it's var log, auth log, but same thing. We, we do collect that as well, by the way. Um, so we can both get the, the auditing event, or we can just parse the file. This is now the information passed from the file. So you can see in the last, let's say, four hours, because people seem to have woken up now, uh, you can see these were all the, the failed login attempts uh, to my instance, which is probably not a surprise, because default SSH port, people just tried to log in. Um, this was me when I either used my public key or a password. Yes, don't use passwords, but for the demo I do. Uh, and then you can see which users um, had failed login attempts and where were they coming from. So you can see somebody from China. Normally it's either Russia or China, but somebody from China seems to brute force or try to brute force into my instance. So they have like 700 something plus 200 plus another 200 or so login attempts from this area. And this here was probably me. So if I check like where was the Elastic user coming from, you can see it was only coming from me here. Um, by the way, I would be curious, um, oops, that's the wrong way, uh, how good my geo information is today, because it always depends a bit on geo IP data is sometimes very good and sometimes not so good, but today it seems to be pretty decent. Uh, that seems to be very good. We are more here, further up north, right? Okay, but it's still you. You get you get the city. You get you get a pretty good impression um, of of where we are. Um, since I'm probably on the university network, I would be curious why this is off. Maybe they have another main headquarters here or whatever. But that's what you get from GeoIP lookups. And you can see this was my user from this IP address trying to log in and it failed. Um, anyway, um, let's say we want to do the same thing again and this one, this time it will succeed if I would type it a bit correctly. Okay, um, let's say um, service engine X uh, restart. Um, my user is not in the sudo group so it will need to do something and let's say we want to use this admin user here Luckily, I know their password, and then I just restarted my Nginx. And then you could find those uh, in the executions, for example. So if you look for audit D, um, if you go to the executions, you can see all the executions that have been run by different users. Uh, let's just see what has the Elastic user been up to. So I filter down on those. This is the general A overview. And if you then look here, um, this was the command that I have just ran. So you can see um, I used that to restart Nginx. 
And if you look into the details, um, you will also see, OK, it was the Elastic user uh, running that binary, and it was successfully executed by somebody in the root group. Um, and you see where it happened. And like the specific user groups, like who has been accessing what and which permissions, et cetera. So this event has been collected by the auditing event. Um, now let's do something else. Let's say um, we log in with the admin user. By the way, something I didn't mention is Audit D is just collecting information. It's not blocking anything. It's not like SE Linux that can block bad calls. Audit D is really just passive and it's just collecting what are you up to. Um, um, before I showed that power abuse thing, so let's try to do the power abuse uh, where the uh, a user with admin privileges is looking into the home directory of a specific user. Um, so we have. Let's say we have the home directory. OK, that looks OK. Um, let's say we have an Elastic user. That might be interesting. You, we look into the Elastic user. Uh, user. And then we see, OK, we has a secret TXT file. Um, li little surprise. Um, let's, do, let's check out what the secret of that user is. Um, will this work? No, there is no sudo. Um, let's make sure we run sudo. Uh, and then you can see it's my secret. Um, OK, that's also not super surprising that we could read that. Uh, but let's see how, how to figure out what has happened here. So I mentioned those tags before. So uh, we, we had those in the configuration. And if we scroll further down, Somebody will have the power abuse. Here we have the power abuse. So this is the exact rule for the power abuse. Um, so when somebody accesses the home directory of a user with a, uh, an ID greater than 1,000, uh, and it's somebody in the pseudo group, uh, then report the power abuse. Uh, so basically, we can just filter down on these events, um, which looks something like this. I'm in the audit beat data. And then you could just say uh, we have a tag, uh, and the tag is, and then you have like the common tags that people do. So for example, here we have the power reviews. I just filter down on those. Um, you can see we had a couple, but let's see what the last, the latest one was. And hopefully, um, it's no, it's not the Vim info that we want to see. But yeah, uh, since Vim, Vim VI is always creating multiple files here, uh, where is my no, it's also not Vim basic. So this is the one that I wanted. So you can see we were run running cat uh, on this file. And basically, you can then see like which user was doing that. And we reported that the power abuse, uh, that user ID um, with root privileges on that file. So we were collecting those. Um, for example, if I would uh, uh, log out of that user again and say I want to log in with my general user, and I say I want to, for example, see the um, etc passwd, we had a rule for that as well. You can just see that because, well, that's a publicly accessible file. It's generally also not super critical. Uh, but if you, for example, filter down, I think we called it uh, developers pass WD read. So there I had a very specific tag to filter those events. And then you can see, OK, there was just, um, just now it happened. And you can then see, OK, this user, the Elastic user, ran bin cat on etc pass WD. And whatever your critical files would be, you could just monitor those and figure out what they're up to. OK. Um, moving on, we've seen that. Um, the next thing we can do is, and we've added that, so the auditing, the audit D stuff only works for Linux because only the Linux kernel has audit D. Um, we do have something else in the audit beat module, which is file integrity monitoring. And that works on the major operating systems. Uh, depending on what operating system you have, we basically watch your file system and watch for changes and hash all the files in 
So you watch a file or a directory, we hash all those, and every time you change something, we will detect that, oh, something has changed with these events, depending on your operating system. And we can just tell you, okay, somebody put some new information in your uh, web service directory. So for example, um, let's say, um, this, is, uh, this is your web website. Um, not very spectacular, um, but somebody uh, was able to break into your server and just changed it. And I will probably need a different user to have permissions to do that. So let's change to somebody who has root privileges just in case. Um, so for example, let's say uh, we, we have var, www, html, and then we should have an index file. Um, and then you see this is my welcome message. And let's say we want to change this. So we've changed the file, and suddenly your professional website um, doesn't look that professional anymore because you have the new emoji in there. Um, and you want to figure out where is that coming from, or when did that even change? Um, so for that, we have, uh, let's quickly look at the rules. So if you scroll further down that file, you see here we have the so-called file integrity module. This is the path that we are monitoring. And well, we just set some limits, so don't scan more than 50 megabytes uh, per second. And don't scan files larger than 10 megabytes, because otherwise it might just be too much for your CPU. You can also change the, the hash type. So we are sticking to the default, which is SHA-1 that we have. But we have a couple of others. I'll get back to those in the slides. Um, with that, let's see if anything had changed in our file system. So I have a dashboard for that. Uh, by the way, all of these dashboards are pre-built. I didn't build those myself. Um, I'm lazy. I'm just using what we have. Um, so we have, sorry, that this is called differently audit file integrity. This is the one I want. So you can see in the last four hours, no files have been changed on my website. Now, just now, something has happened. So three files were created, um, three updated, and one moved by a user in the group root. And why three? Um, might be slightly confusing, but you know, VI is opening like the swap file in the background, which is kind of hard to see, but you can see we have a swap file, we have an SWX file, whatever that was, and then we have the actual file. So those were edited, and you can see um, that was the most updated file, the swap file. Uh, and you can just see these were all the files that were changed in here. Um, you can see on my host, this was the event. And then you can see, OK, when I closed VI, the swap file was deleted. Uh, like all these temporary files were deleted. Um, and you can see this file was moved from the old state to the new state. Um, so these are all the events, basically, that happened in that folder. And we're just keeping track of any changes in the directory. Uh, if you upload it by FTP, you would only have like the replacement operation to see. Um, these are all the hashes that we support. Um, the very last one is the fastest. So if you're con uh, concerned about like how performant is that and how much uh, time will this hashing take, uh, the last one, the XXH64, that is the most performant hashing algorithm that we have in there. Um, OK, we've seen that. Um, Sometimes if you get kind of uh, stuck with, oh, we have too many events, we need to figure out what is going on, we have some other thing um, that's kind of like learning automatically what is normal. For example, this could be like how many users are locked into your system where you see during the day it's kind of like a lot of people, but over the weekend it's not that many, and at night it's also not that many. And then you could just see, otherwise this one here, this drop might be very hard to find. Um, but here you basically see the... This is an anomaly, so this is just like time anomalies over time series you, where you know like this blue band is basically, these are the expected values, and this is where you have an anomaly. And this would then just tell you, okay, here for example, you have too few users who are logged in, maybe your network was down. Or if you have too many, maybe somebody was trying to brute force their way into your system or whatever. Um, so sometimes it's very hard to find the right thresholds to alert for that. So 
you could just automatically do that. Okay, to wrap up, I always compare the stack a bit to Lego because you have all these building blocks, but you need to um, kind of put them together the right way. So you need to have the right ODD rules, and then you need to kind of look for the right stuff. It's not like an out-of-the-box solution that just does pixie magic and it runs automatically and does everything for you. Uh, you will need to like know what are you looking for, what is your kind of threat model. For example, like which files are sensitive that somebody accesses or which uh, folders shouldn't change on their own, like some configurations, settings. Um, we do provide like these building blocks, but we will need to do that, putting it together the right way yourself. Um, yeah, generally, audit D is great. It's just very hard to parse and work with the output format. That's why we added audit beat to have that in a more structured format and also enrich it with some more information. And then you can combine that information with more logs and dashboards. For example, you could just get auth log or general logs from your applications and then combine those to see what is really happening with your system. Um, if you want to try that out yourself, um, you can, I'm just giving you the, the regular user, not the root user, but you could um, SSH into that instance. Um, and if you want to try out dashboards, you will be automatically logged in if you head to dashboards, um, then you can just head to the dashboard. Um, since we still have three minutes left, we can do one more small demo that I kind of forgot to do, or forgot. Let's say, um, uh, let's say we have netcat, we listen on port 1025. How do we talk to this now? If anybody has their uh, laptop out or has something like telnet, uh, it should be something like this. Um, so you can see uh, whatever I'm, whatever I've typed here will appear here. So if anybody feels inclined to um, send a message as well, um, you can just telnet to my host name and port 1025. Now, how would I find that somebody has opened a specific port? Um, I'll keep it pretty simple and I'll just say like, I'm heading to the raw events and I'm just interested in like, somebody reported some weird behavior on port 1025. So I'll just use the full text search over everything I have in my system. And okay, we have one event. And if you open that one, uh, you will actually see here, um, somebody has used netcat and then there was the command the, or the, the arguments that they ran. So we have a netcat um, listen on port 1025. So you could figure out that somebody has done it. And well, it's a very basic chat server, but this is one of the ways how to figure out that somebody has opened a port and has been up to good or no good, depending on where you stand. Um, okay, if you want to try out the code, um, it's mostly like Ansible and a bit of Terraform just to set it up because you saw I just started that at midnight or so. I basically run, ran Terraform to create me one AWS instance and then ran a playbook and threw in the configuration files. That's all I did. All the sample code is there. Um, that's probably the most relevant part. Um, any questions? I think we have like five minutes left for questions. It should be perfect. Six, five. Six, yeah. yes please. Can you enhance events with Kubernetes? Kubernetes yes. Um, so that's actually a very good point. Um, I let me da, 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 da. let's kill this one. So we have here we have the so-called processors, and the processors they include the cloud information, the host information. We do have that for Docker. What basically what you do with Docker is uh, you need to have access to the Docker daemon because we, we, we need the socket and then we look up like stuff like um, the base image and tags from the Docker image. We have the same thing for Kubernetes um, where we go against the namespace and the pod and we will enrich all of that. And then you could just say, I'm interested in just one specific namespace or pod or whatever and filter down to that. Um, and we very recently added one more. Give me a second. Uh, so just to um, 
okay, we have the add metadata here. Um, so we have the host metadata, the Docker, Kubernetes. I thought we had one more. Sorry? Yes, yes, exactly. It's, um, yes, sorry, we, we are in Filebit, but they all have the same, uh, they all have the same. So uh, you can add all of those <laughs> in all the beats. And I thought we had, was it OpenShift? I, I know that we have integration for one more. Um, I, I would need to look that up. That, is, that one is very new, and I haven't tried it out myself, but Kubernetes and Docker are very common and useful, as might be host or the cloud metadata. For the cloud metadata, we support at least AWS and GCP, uh, maybe Azure as well, and I would need to check. But those are the ones that we need for those, uh, or support for those processes. Also, that's kind of a like pretty cheap lookup, because basically what we do is we generate or we cache that and then enrich every event. For example, for the Docker socket, we'll just cache that and then reuse that. For, to get the AWS information, there is this special IP address on AWS, which is 169. something something something. If you query that, you will get the information about the instance itself back, and we'll basically cache that and enrich every information or every event with that information from that API. That's how we get to that metadata, yes. But that, that's a good point. Yes, Docker and Kubernetes are supported. Any other questions? Otherwise, I have, still have a couple of stickers over there. Um, since you're not that many, it will probably last for everybody. Um, So you're because you mentioned about the generating the checksum to check if yes. the file is changing. Do you have any I don't know limits that if the file is integrated? So the question was about the performance for the file integrity module. Um, so we we have done benchmarks like which hashing algorithm is the fastest and we have like a bunch of the ones that we support. Um, you can also say like don't hash files over X size and don't hash more than X megabyte per second. So you can totally limit how much resources you want to use. So nobody can DDoS basically um, your, your instance by just changing too many files and then you will exhaust your CPU. Also, I would assume that hashing generally should be pretty cheap, but of course it depends how much files you change. Um, um, I mean, don't, don't throw it on, on just root and then for, for the entire file system. Like, uh, probably put that on folders with contain, which contain like the sensitive information that makes sense. Also, otherwise you will have a lot of garbage events. Um, I'm not sure we have like done too many benchmarks on like super large scale, but we have tried out various um, hashing algorithms and you can just limit it to what you want to do. So it shouldn't kill your instance, at least not that part. Any final questions? Thanks so much.